Gorgeous and fluid 1988's Ninja Gaiden for the NES revolutionized video game narrative by paying tribute to film classics while sporting best in-class action design. This is the annotated Ninja Gaiden. Welcome to the final act of the game, The Fall of the Demon. It's here that we wrestle with the fact that Malth was the opponent of Ken Hayabusa in the faithful duel that opened the game, but no, he's not Ryu's father's killer. With this simple setup, we're often running onto Death's Bridge, in the last, though arguably toughest, areas of the game. Though this last level runs at a high speed, we're going to use these final moments to take a breath and discuss how the game came to be and some of the references we've seen and will run into later. First, since we just dealt with the last of them, let's talk about the Malice Four, which, as a quick reminder, are the bosses Barbarian, Bomberhead, Bassacre, and Bloody Malt. This naming convention is likely a reference to the Four Heavenly Kings, or Shi Tenno, of Japanese Buddhism. These are deities that rule over the four cardinal directions and are constantly alluded to in Japanese popular culture, from Sailor Moon to the Street Fighter series. This isn't the last we see of them, though. Ninja Gaiden 2 repurposes these characters as common enemies, complete with redrawn spites to make them closer to Ryu's own stature. But what does Ninja Gaiden actually mean? And how did a game ship outside of Japan with this title at a time when Western marketers were doing their absolute best to whitewash away any semblance of Japanese design? Well, I don't believe there's a satisfactory answer to that second question outside of xenophobic marketing in an era that embraced it, even if Ninja Gaiden was more of an exception to nascent video game localization rules, but we can certainly tackle the first. As was discussed in the video for Act 3, the game and its arcade sibling were released under the name Ninja Ryu Kenden in Japan, which roughly translates into Legend of the Dragon Ninja Sword. Since some ballyhoo was made of Ryu taking his father's dragon sword in the opening cinematic, apparently the same one that killed the demon 700 years in the past, this name makes some sense, even though the story is not really about the sword when it all boils down to it. As to why the game was localized under the name Ninja Gaiden, which translates into the Japanese term for side story, Artist and designer Masato Kato mentioned in an interview published on website Hardcore Gaming 101 that since planning staff ultimately couldn't find a translation that quite hit the mark for Ryu Kenden, Gaiden just sounded cool, and it stuck. The game and its arcade counterpart were released in European territories as Shadow Warriors, as the word ninja was censored by the BBC and UK markets, but this was not any sort of government law. But be they legends of swords or just elaborate subplots, why ninjas? Well, because of America, that's why. America and a savvy video game developer who knew well enough to capitalize on the 80s ninja craze. The development staff of this game, including Kato and director Hideo Yoshizawa, have been interviewed numerous times over the years about the impetus for both this and the arcade ninja guidance, and the story remains the same. The president of Tecmo, a man named Yoshihito Kakihara, saw that ninjas had turned into an inexplicable fad in the United States and decided to capitalize on it. Per Yoshizawa in a roundtable interview for the release of the Ninja Gaiden definitive soundtrack for Brave Way Productions, Kakihara said, Go make a game with ninjas in it. Make a game with a lot of quick, loud sounds. Given the output of schlock martial arts films being poured into US theaters and the ever-expanding home rental market, Kakihara likely knew of movies with ninjas as a plot device, like the 1980 Chuck Norris film The Octagon, Canon Films' loose series of movies starting with Enter the Ninja in 1981, and, of course, the American Ninja franchise starring the aforementioned Michael Dudikoff, which began in 1985. These critically reviled films were unlikely box office successes and are often cited as starting a ninja craze in the US that lasted throughout the decade. As was mentioned before, this led to Tecmo starting two development teams that worked on the same floor, with Yoshizawa taking advantage of his Famicom experience and a man named Ijima, or Strong Shima, making the arcade game. In an interview with Gaming Moe, Yoshizawa recalls that Ijima was a fan of belt scrollers, which is why the arcade game turned into one. Yet, both men knew that the plan leaned into the absurd and understood their assignments well. Per a reunion of Yoshizawa, Kato, and Keiji Yamagishi for Polygon.com, Yoshizawa leads the story by saying, quote, In America, people kind of saw ninjas as modern-day superheroes, and he essentially ran with it. In the Gaming Moe interview, he mentions that the team special ordered foreign magazines to reference the American image of a ninja. What they found were apocryphal and even fantastical elements, such as magic, kung fu, and nunchaku, which to their eyes were inauthentic traits. For the Polygon story, he says that he didn't want to make a game too historical, even though he mentions early in the interview that these are historical figures, highly associated with Japan's Edo period, but not to make it a superhero game. This is just me saying it, but since the greatest threat to a ninja is a bird in this adventure, Ryu is by no means Batman. Ichima and the Strong Team, though, went all in on the lunacy, from the action itself to the preposterous situations Ryu finds himself in between levels of the arcade game, something that we touched on before. 
In this game though, the death bridge and its exit that we saw earlier look remarkably similar to another game of this era's final level. It leads us to the Hall of Brahmins, which is sometimes considered the hardest individual level of the game for something mentioned in the last episode, an element of chaotic randomness. The bridge sequence near the first ladder upward plagues Ryu with flying ninjas that toss shuriken at odd angles and in intermittent intervals, which makes the jump and slash weapon found right in front of them practically required to progress. Holding on to it, no easy feat, is key for getting through another bridge with both a hooded enemy tossing random knives and a confounding bird from below and then above. These enemy placements feel spaced specifically so that either the hood or one of the birds respawns, which is a devious trick. Certainly not insurmountable without the jump and slash weapon, but much easier without it. These encounters aren't the only reason Act 6 still haunts the nightmares of Ninja Gaiden players, but we'll come back to that in a second. In Hindu philosophy, Brahmins connotes the ultimate reality of the universe. Per its entry in Wikipedia, it is the non-physical, formal, and final cause of all that exists, a pervasive, infinite, eternal truth. Since Ryu is dealing with his own metaphysical threat, it's telling that this section of the castle is named after this since the demon was likely worshipped in a cult-like fashion. This isn't to say that Hinduism is cultish, but devotees of this monster may have found themselves believing that it would bestow upon them a sort of higher consciousness. And here we have the final level of the game, the Temple of Darkness Hall of Judgment. Notice the statues of Hamza, or Hand of Fatima, that we passed early on. This is a symbol used in many cultures from Kabbalistic Judaism to ancient Egyptians that has persevered throughout the millennia and has meant different things to different cultures, often being a ward against the concept of the evil eye. This level throws every type of enemy at us that we've seen so far, including the fourth and final appearance of the Sickle Thrower. But Ryu can mitigate the challenge by employing the last power of dimension, the Time Freeze. While this item does exactly what it sounds like and stops foes in their tracks, crucially, this will also prevent enemies from spawning, which gives Ryu five glorious, unimpeded seconds of movement after collecting it. Now, the trick with this level is to try and carefully plan which items are useful for the gauntlet of final bosses, which we've already begun. The final stretch of the stage offers Ryu both the Windmill Star and Art of the Fire Wheel multiple times, which should alert him that things are about to go down, and that the player needs to plan accordingly. Both of these weapons are valuable assets for the final skill checks of the game, but of course, the Jump and Slash still breaks every situation over its metaphorical knee. And here we have the first of the final three enemies, the Masked Devil. Wait, that's actually Ken Hayabusa, masked and brainwashed, and pitted against his son in a fight to the death for the pleasure of the real guy behind the guy. This film reference should be so ingrained in popular culture that the few who have never actually watched a Star Wars film will know where it comes from. This fight is notable for having Yamagishi's favorite music in the game, which you can hear a bit more clearly in the intro to these individual episodes. In a roundtable interview for the Brave Way Productions definitive soundtrack, he mentions that he and Yoshizawa are fans of British rock, and that the delayed echoey sounds of this track are inspired by how U2 band member The Edge plays guitar. Yamagishi and the other sound designers are particularly proud of the drum sounds of this game, stating in the same interview that they were a major leap for the NES. For his part, he also mentions in the Polygon story that he had worked hard to make sure that he made one of the first Famicom games that featured a drum roll in it. These last three fights are unique amongst other bosses. The first with the Masked Devil is obviously more of a fight with the environment than an enemy, and the choice of weapon that Ryu comes armed with will dictate how this should be approached. Of course, the controlling device is stationary though, so one good jump and slash will end this pretty quickly. The problem isn't that fight though, it's this one against the Jikiyu. Before that, we have to mention that the cutscene leading up to this second encounter has an unused portion of the script still found in the code, as noted by the cutting room floor, notable for its use of the word damn, as in damn, he's awake, which was a forbidden word for Nintendo localization at the time. The word did sneak into the SNES re-release for the Ninja Gaiden trilogy though. Anyway, once we finish the Masked Devil encounter, per the rules that the game establishes right from the very beginning, Ryu's spiritual power is counted down toward his total score after a boss fight, starting the next level zeroed out and weaponless. The transition between these last encounters operates in the same manner. None of this would be a problem if the Jikio fight was fair. With a smaller hurt box than his triangular frame would suggest and a barrage of projectiles that home in on Ryu, players are typically given an ignoble death and treated to the game's worst, most infamous insult, a trip back to the beginning of Act 6. This only happens when a player dies to one of these last bosses, not anywhere else in the whole stage. While this may seem like a programming bug, the reality is that it's an intentional cruelty brought upon by an unnamed programmer. Per Yoshizawa in the Polygon story, he wanted players to be sent back to the halfway point of the act. The coder lied to him and said it would be implemented, but sent them back to the beginning regardless. In the Hardcore Gaming 101 interview, Kato agrees. Hey, that's not bad, he said. 
Given what Yoshizawa mentioned in a previous episode, that sub-weapons were intentionally placed to deal with specific challenges, the fact that the game robs you of them in this situation feels like the player is set up to fail here. As if to pour salt into the wound, a level select exists in the code of the game, also found on the cutting room floor, but is not normally accessible, so players need to either find a way to kill this second boss with just the sword, or dig deep and work their way through the whole act again. This is something you probably didn't want to watch, so let's just deal with the Jikio and move on. As Ken passes slowly after his noble sacrifice to save Ryu, again ripped straight out of Return of the Jedi, we see the prophecy of the statues manifest in the form of a lunar eclipse before Ryu takes on the demon itself. Eclipses are significant aspects of Japanese folklore per the legend of Amano Iwato, or Heaven's Rock Cave. In the myth, Susanoo, the goddess storms, drives his sister, the sun goddess Amaterasu, into a cave, bringing darkness over the land. The other gods had to lure her out with depending on what you're reading, a combination of lewd dancing and, most crucially, a mirror, which ended this origin story of the first eclipse. Like the four heavenly kings, this topic is revisited in Japanese popular culture time and again. As for the demon, though, it's unique in that it's a combination of both the worst and simplest challenges to overcome. As for the latter, we have to kill multiple stationary targets, which is simple enough on the surface. The head and the heart are the only objects that absolutely need to die, as underlined by most music about bad breakups, but without any kind of projectile weapon and the ammo to use it, the tail must also be disposed of. This would be a non-issue were it not for the flying shrimp-like objects the monster ejects, crashing down on Ryu randomly. These become more frequent as the fight drags on. This is the fight most egregiously altered for the PC Engine version of the game. Not only is the heart not the final target, that would be the protruding entrails of the neck after the head is removed, but the way it attacks is also dramatically different. Regardless of version, killing it reveals that the demon is made up of multiple sprites and not just simply targets on a background layer like contemporary action games such as the final battle with Dracula in Castlevania III Dracula's Curse. With the final boss finished, we're treated to the last, most obvious callback to the Skywalker saga that this video can bludgeon you with, but not our final references to classic movies. Though we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, this transitions us into the final cinematic of the game with our last handful of movie tropes, including Foster's obvious heel turn to set up future adventures, how the good guy inexplicably gets the girl, and then a slight twist on the cowboy riding off into the sunset since this particular sun will rise. Still, there are some fun things to mention here. First is that we finally put a name to the face with CIA agent Irene Liu, spelled in the Mandarin L-I-U for the PC Engine version. That would imply that she's of Chinese descent, but the sequels for the NES game and their re-release for the SNES keep the original L-E-W spelling. She's also, ironically, the last bird that we deal with, given her code name is Sea Swallow, which is an avian species common through Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Then again, Hayabusa is also the Japanese word for peregrine, a type of falcon, so birds were inescapable in this game from start to finish. And though I hasten to remind you that the creators of this game have never mentioned it by name, this will be the final time that I at least bring up Castlevania, which I couldn't help but do throughout this series with this easily comparable scene. As we watch the Temple of Darkness crumble into dust, starting with the location where we fought Mulf high on the Eastern Bridge, our thoughts are with the fallen ninjas and vampire hunters that are lost amidst the rubble. When the credits begin to roll, we're treated to a sort of remix of The Amazing Ryu, which is the soundtrack for Stage 4 2. Remix may be a strong word though, since it's the exact same song with an ending and not a loop, which is its own track on the game's various soundtrack releases, as well as the sound test the players can access on the title screen via button combination. A separate debug sound test exists buried in the code, as found by the cutting room floor yet again. Yoshizawa stayed with the series as executive producer for the latter NES entries, where he contributed to action design and writing. Kato then took over direction for the cinema displays in Ninja Gaiden 2, The Dark Sword of Chaos, which he regards as his series' favorite, per the interview on Hardcore Gaming 101, and then action design for Ninja Gaiden 3, The Ancient Ship of Doom. Yamagishi left the series after this game. None of these men, though, were involved in the wider Ninja Gaiden universe that had spun out of this game. Starting in 1991, Sega began their own small line of Ninja Gaidens, notably not Ninja Ryu Kendens for their home consoles. 
The first for the portable Game Gear was released in 1991, shortly after Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES in North America and Japanese markets. The second was released the next year for the Sega Master System, but only in PAL regions where that machine was thriving. Both games essentially start with the same contrivance. Ryu's Ninja Village is attacked, and he has to get to the bottom as to why. The portable game is notable in that the plot, such as it is, actually revolves around a demon trying to steal the Dragon Sword, making this an honest to Nimpo God Ninja Ryu Kenda. The home game, while hewing a bit closer to the design of the NES counterpart, remains geographically locked in Japan, and ends the first level with a battle against a sumo wrestler reminiscent of Strong Shima's arcade entry in 1988. These releases are certainly meant to invoke the NES games, though, with their title cards before levels and the use of cutscenes between them. They also do nothing to retcon anything from the original game, either. So if you squint, you can actually call these ninja side stories if that's your headcanon. In fact, while an avowed fan of the original Famicom games, the Sega Master System Ninja Gaiden looks more of a blueprint for Tecmo's reboot of the franchise for the Xbox starting in 2004, which Kato would eventually be involved with for Ninja Gaiden 3 in 2012. Reboot producer Tomonobu Itagaki purposely made them as prequels to the NES games, though. This same sort of after-the-fact prequelizing can also be said of 1991's Ninja Gaiden Shadow for the monochrome Game Boy. As is now a piece of gaming history lore, Shadow was originally developed by Natsume as a portable take on Shadow of the Ninja for the NES before Tecmo seized upon the game and licensed it with Ryu as the central character, placing it before the original Famicom game in the Ryu Kenden timeline. A third Sega game for the Genesis and Mega Drive was in development near this period as well, and riffed on the original arcade game with its belt-scrolling levels. It was never completed or released, but games media of the time did have small previews in games like Die Hard Game Fan. And with that, the game finally comes to a close. Thank you for watching. Special thanks for this series goes to Diamond Fighter Retronauts, Anthony John Agnello of IGN, and especially Mohamed Tayer of Brave Wave Productions. Thanks also to all the fans, speedrunners, and archivists for their work in keeping the game alive for more than 35 years. A series like this one would not exist if not for their dedication. My name is John Lerden, and I appreciate your support very much. Thank you again for watching, and please look forward to more annotated games features soon.